Hi everyone, I'm Emma and I manage CAP's Copy Advice team. Today I'm going to talk to you about issues around influencer marketing and the key things that influencers and brands need to bear in mind to ensure that they stick to the ad rules. In this webinar, I'm going to be covering the ongoing issue of ad labelling disclosure. I'm hoping to stick to around 30 minutes with a 15 minute Q&A at the end. Feel free to submit your questions throughout. My colleague Judith is going to wade through what we get and flag some for me to answer. Please try and stick to questions around the principles rather than very specific scenarios so we can keep this as relevant to the whole audience as possible. And please remember that I don't work for the CMA and I can't give legal advice. So let's kick off with the main thing that I'd like you to take away today. Uh, just make it clear, there really isn't much more to it than that. We've seen a lot of misinformation spread throughout the influencer marketing community and plenty of misunderstandings about what the requirements are. But at, at its very core, it's just making clear when you're advertising. Now, rather than just effectively reading out the influencer's guide to you, I thought I'd try a different approach and see if I can dispel some of the myths around ad labeling and disclosure. Myth one, we often hear the argument that the audience already knows when something's advertising and the ad labeling is just completely unnecessary. So we asked, together with Ipsos Mori, the ASA undertook research on consumers' understanding of advertising on social media and the labels often used. The full reports are available on our website, but the main thing we found was that people really struggle to identify when social media posts by influencers are ads. That means that at an absolute minimum, these posts need to be prominently labelled with something like ad or hashtag ad up front to make it really clear. Myth two. A lot of people believe that not labelling ads isn't really doing any harm and ultimately doesn't really matter. But not making clear that an ad is an ad is against the law and not without good reason. Failing to make this clear can mislead consumers materially, cause damage to the wider industry and the players within it, and also cause you plenty of grief if you end up on the wrong side of the requirements. Under consumer protection law, which our rules reflect, using editorial content in the media to promote a product where a brand has paid for the promotion without making that clearly identifiable to the consumer is an unfair commercial practice. Other unfair practices include falsely claiming or giving the impression that an, indi an individual is acting outside of their business purposes or falsely representing themselves as a consumer, failing to identify a commercial intent behind a social media post and omitting or hiding material information. All this really means is that not making clear that a post is an ad could mislead people. That could be about the quality of a product. Uh, if an influencer is making a big song and dance about how wonderful something is without really knowing or caring if it is, it could also mislead consumers about the motivations for mentioning a product. Um, so if an influencer claims to use a product or implies that they love it, when really they're just getting paid to say that. It's also, and most importantly, misleading consumers by omission. So whether they're hearing a genuine, unincentivized opinion or a possibly also genuine opinion that has been paid for, is likely to affect their decisions about how much weight they want to give a particular claim and how likely they are to go on to make a purchase. They need to have all of that material information when making decisions like that. When brands and influencers don't make it clear, they risk ruining things for everyone. When some people are doing the right thing and others aren't, there's the potential for this to result in unfair competition between brands, particularly when consumers are misled into buying lower quality or more expensive goods. But perhaps more devastating than that is the erosion of trust. If audiences feel they're being lied to, they'll switch off, unfollow, go elsewhere. And that has the potential to affect the value and impact of influencer marketing generally. Before you know it, marketing budgets are going elsewhere and no one's making any money from influencer marketing anymore. Without trust, influencer marketing becomes the irritating pop-up or screen obscuring banner ad that people created ad blockers to get away from. And finally, it's pretty bad for you if you don't make it clear. While the ASA generally prefers to work with brands and influencers to resolve issues, there's a limit to how accommodating they can be for the reasons I've outlined, as well as others. A formal ruling from the ASA ends up on their website, and as you've seen on the previous slide, it gets noticed. There are also other sanctions that can have quite detrimental effects on brands and influencers. And there's also the outside chance that the CMA or trading standards could take people to court. So myth three, too often we hear that the requirements are just too complicated and difficult to understand. Now, I know I pretty much live and breathe the ad rules, but this really isn't very complicated. 
I mean, if you want complicated, let's have a chat about the requirements for health claims on foods or the rules around the use of personal data for marketing. The requirement here is really nothing more than making clear that an ad is an ad. So what's an ad? There are various types of ads online, but there are probably four main categories commonly seen in influencer marketing. So the first is when a brand gives an influencer a payment, and that can be any form of monetary payment, a loan of a product, a free product, or any other incentive, any post promoting the brand or its products becomes subject to consumer protection law, and the commercial relationship needs to be disclosed. When a brand also has control over the content, they become subject to the cat code as well, and it's at that point that the ASA can become involved too. Affiliate marketing, where you're posting hyperlinks or personalized codes that earn a commission on sales or clicks are also covered by the cap code, as opposed to where you're promoting your own products or services, either that you're selling yourself or those you're collaborating in the creation of. And finally, any prize draws, competitions or giveaways that you run. So how do you make it clear? Well, if a social media channel is clearly brand owned or there's a very clear connection, it's usually clear that it's advertising for that brand. But this is always considered on a case by case basis. Here, Marley Simpson um, is promoting her own range of contact lenses. It was her own product, but the ASA decided that there wasn't enough in the content or context here to make clear that this was advertising. Similarly, this post on Zoe de Passa's Instagram included an image of products that were part of a brand collaboration. As consumers would have had to click on the more button to see text that indicated that this was advertising, the ASA considered that this was not obviously identifiable as a marketing communication prior to engagement. Generally speaking, if it's not otherwise immediately clear that something's an ad, the easiest way to make it clear is to include a label up front. As a minimum, the ASA and the CMA expect a prominent ad label at the beginning. This means that it should be the first thing people see and before they click through or otherwise engage with the content. Where this ultimately is depends on the platform or the device you're using, so you need to take this into account. Make sure you've thought about what people see first when they look at the post and how they navigate to the post. It needs to be clear no matter how they get there or what they're viewing it on. Depending on the platform, this might mean the label needs to be in the title, a thumbnail or on an image if that's all people see first. That brings us on to myth four, that it doesn't matter what label you use or where you put it. Well, of course it does. The main thing to remember is that you need to make it obvious. Any label or other means you use to highlight the ad needs to be prominent, meaning it has to be obvious to the audience. Timely, meaning upfront, before people click or engage and suitable for all potential devices. Burying the label in a sea of hashtags or putting it where it can only be seen by clicking see more uh, just isn't going to cut it. And finally, it needs to be clear. So it needs to be clear and unambiguous about what it is. The ASA's research found that advertising must almost invariably be different, vis visually speaking, from the surrounding content in order to be obviously identifiable. Although the ASA maintains that the use of an ad label at the beginning is the absolute minimum expected, there is some best practice guidance that might be useful for you to bear in mind. Disclosure should be visually striking, appropriately placed, use clear, explicit language and words that are easily understood, and perhaps include a logo to support greater recognition. And it's also the case that greater standardization within the industry can ultimately help consumers to better recognize when they're seeing advertising content. I'm not gonna go through every possible label, and believe me, I've heard quite a few creative suggestions to date, but I just want to reinforce that although neither the CMA nor the ASA is technically prescriptive about how disclosure should be made, by far the easiest and the safest is to use a label that just says it how it is. You may notice a theme here, and that's intentional. In the course of the ASA's research, the most significant difference between the variations of a post was recorded for a Zoe Sugg example, where 34% of adults identified the original post as definitely an ad, compared to 57% of those who saw a version with hashtag advert added to the bottom right hand corner of the picture in a colour that contrasted clearly with the background. As any label used in a disclosure needs to be understood unambiguously by the audience, it will always depend on the context, but we generally recommend avoiding these labels, particularly if this is all you're relying on to disclose. 
going back to the ASA's research, 48% of those who said they could recall seeing SP said they would not be confident or would be unsure about explaining its meaning. This was also the case for other labels with 36% not confident or unsure about gifted, 35% for spawn, 33% for affiliate, and 33% for collab, and finally 32% for paid partnership. Whereas only 18% of respondents said they were not confident or were unsure about the meaning of advertisement and advert. One additional point, if you're targeting under 12s or have a large proportion of your audience under the age of 12, it needs to be even clearer when ads are ads. They struggle even more than adults to tell the difference, so make sure that any disclosure is prominent and interruptive, uses clear age-appropriate language, makes clear before they engage, and also makes explicitly clear who the brand or advertiser is. Moving on now to a few examples, and um, we'll share links to the rulings uh, following the webinar. First up, we have a post from Millie McIntosh promoting J2O. There was a branded shot at the end of a video, and the text included hashtag SP as shorthand for sponsored post. But the ASA considered that neither the label nor its placement made it sufficiently clear that this was advertising before engaging with the content. An example here from TV presenter AJ Adudu. It was in a similar style to her usual tweets and included branded hashtags and an app mention for Alpro, but the ASA concluded that this wasn't obviously advertising. It could equally be seen as a genuinely independent post. It therefore needed to make it clearer. Here we have an example of an Instagram story from Louise Thompson. Although the ASA acknowledged that the post contained some elements that indicated there might be a commercial relationship, they considered that the content and context of the post did not make clear that it was advertising as opposed to, for example, genuinely independent editorial content. And a more recent example now from Matthew Zorpus. Again, while the post differed in some respects from his usual posts and contained some elements that indicated that there might be a commercial relationship, the ASA considered that the hashtags were insufficient to ensure that this post was obviously identifiable as an ad, both when viewed in feed and when it was viewed in its entirety once users had clicked on it. Finally, just a quick example that wasn't even investigated. Here we have the Sacconi Jolies, including a short section of advertising content within wider unrelated editorial content. Immediately before the advertising section started, a label, so ad in a circle, was included on screen, and Jonathan explained verbally that the next part was advertising. The ASA concluded that it was clear enough where the advertising was and dismissed this complaint. Moving on now to myth five. There have been lots of comments that influencers are being unfairly singled out under these requirements. Now that's not strictly true, and while there are lots of similarities out there in other media, it's important to appreciate that it's not necessarily all exactly the same. There's a lot to be said for context, and there are different legislative and regulatory frameworks in different media, particularly for TV and radio. That said, the CAP code rules are largely media neutral and are regularly applied in other media and have been for years. As you can see, the ASA's first annual report made reference to this very requirement. And now just to prove that the ASA do pull up other publishers for not making sufficiently clear when something's advertising, here's a ruling against a Dylon ad in the form of a Buzzfeed article. The ASA considered that although there were elements that implied a connection with Dylon, they were not sufficient to make clear that the main content of the web page was an advertorial. They acknowledged the inclusion of the label brand publisher near the top of the web page next to the dial on name and logo, but considered that it was not particularly prominent and the terminology did not, either in itself or in conjunction with the other page elements, adequately convey the commercial nature of the content to consumers. Another one here from the Liverpool Echo. The ASA noted a banner at the top of the article above the headline that stated, in association with reach solutions, marketing solutions designed to grow your business but considered that it was likely to be viewed as part of the website's architecture rather than a specific feature of the story. They also didn't think it was sufficient to identify the content specifically as advertising or to counteract the impression that the content was entirely editorial. Finally, just a quick broadcast example. The ASA upheld against two 27-minute long-form TV ads called The It Factor by a consortium that promoted Italian goods and culture abroad. 
as the ad contained a number of features that would cause viewers to assume that they were watching editorial program, the ads needed to contain clear, prominent signposts to ensure that it was obvious to viewers that the content was advertising material and not editorial. However, because the on-screen text advertisement feature only appeared intermittently in a faint font that lacked prominence, and because the qualification ad feature in the program listings wouldn't have been seen by many viewers, the ASA concluded that the ads were not obviously distinguishable from editorial content and that the audience was unlikely to quickly recognise the messaging that was advertised. So final myth, number six. There seems to be a sense that people think regulators just love to catch people out and get them in trouble. I guarantee you, without a shadow of a doubt, the executives at the ASA don't want to catch anyone out. Dealing with over 30,000 complaints a year is a time-consuming business, and they'd much rather people got the simpler stuff right first time. That's why we publish guidance, offer training and events like this webinar, and have a team dedicated to giving advice to the industry on the ad rules. On screen is a list of some of the places you can get help. And we're currently in the process of updating all our guidance on this topic. So make sure you're signed up to our Insight newsletter so you can be amongst the first to know when it all goes live. I'll just round off then with some general tips. Um, so for brands, keep records of products you've sent, who to and what you've said. Carry out some reasonable monitoring of posts to check disclosures being made. Provide clear guidance to any influencers you're working with. And wherever there is a contract, include disclosure as a specific term. Finally, never ask an influencer not to disclose. You're asking someone to break the law. On the flip side, for influencers, keep records of products you've been sent and by whom so you can keep track. Always disclose whenever you've received any form of payment. Try to think like your audience. What label will they understand? If you have a contract with a brand, make sure disclosure is a specific term. And finally, never agree or offer not to disclose. And if someone asks you to, let us know and we'll pass that message on to the people who should know. So I think we've got there a little quicker than expected, <laughs> but let's get on to some questions. Judith? Okay, so we've got a question here um, that says, someone would love to know the difference um, between using gifted for a free press item to review versus ad. Now, I'm not sure what they're necessarily getting at there. Um, it is potentially more a question for the CMA than for us. Um, if ultimately the free item has been given and the content of that review has been in some way controlled by the brand, it would have to be ad. And um, the ASA is not gonna accept gifted um, for that type of content. Um, the next question is, will a copy of the slides and a recording be provided? Yes, yes it will. Do you have any other questions? Everyone's being very quiet. Maybe I've gone through it too quickly. <laughs> what counts as control? Um, that's a very good question. Um, in terms of control, it can be anything from asking them to include key messaging um, to having final approval of the post um, and anything in between those two. Um, I suppose the, the rule of thumb should be if the publisher was not entirely free to post, not post or post whatever they like, then there was some measure of editorial control and the ASA is therefore going to be interested in regulating that type of content. Question there is the general public notified when there's an influencer that's failed to adhere to the code? Um, only insofar as formal rulings are like formally published uh, on the ASA's website um, in a sort of name and shame capacity. Um, so beyond that, the the kind of individual complaints are reported back to the complainant, but not necessarily everyone else. Um, I think at last count this year, there'd been well over a thousand complaints about influencer marketing. Um, and we don't report on every single one of those publicly. Okay, so if an influencer receives a product and lists it as ad on the first post, but then later talks about the product, for example, does another story a week later about that product, do they still have to put hashtag ad on every post about that product? Um, from 
the ASA's perspective, they're only concerned with the ones that were subject to payment and control. So that's presumably the first post. Um, but as far as the CMA is concerned, every time you then feature that product, you're likely to need to make clear that it was given to you free uh, and therefore disclose that that is also an ad. So I would recommend that if you're given anything free, anytime you feature it in any prominent or meaningful way, make sure you've disclosed that. Okay, we have a question there about whether there's any way to ensure uh, the age of audiences for influencers. Um, that's beyond the scope of this webinar, but keep your eye out. We are planning to do another webinar at a future date on targeting uh, for influencer marketing. Um, so I, I won't go into that today, but good question, and we will cover it in future. question about how would an influencer disclose that he or, he or she has received a payment um, by using hashtag ad on the post um, or any other clear label to make clear that that post is advertising or is has been the result of um, a commercial partnership with a brand. It might not feel like one, but the minute you're given a free product, you've received a payment and that makes it a commercial practice. Uh, if we pay an influencer via product and they caption their post with thanks brand, is that okay? Not on its own, it doesn't make clear on its own that that's advertising. Um, so you really need to make it explicitly clear that something is advertising, not just imply that it might be. So we've got a question, when you gift a product to an influencer but the brand has no element of control over the content, how should brands advise them to disclose it? Brands should seek legal advice. Um, this isn't something that's covered by the ASA. As I made clear, the element of control is what brings it within the ASA's remit. And of course, I am talking from the ASA. So um, that's a scenario where you will need to seek legal advice on the best way to go about it. Ultimately, as we understand it, the CMA like hashtag ad as well. OK, it looks like we've potentially stopped. So I think we'll stop here. Um, thank you for listening. Um, if there are enough general questions left over, we'll look at creating a follow-up Q&A article. Uh, we're also hoping to bring more influencing responsibly webinars in 2020 covering different topics like targeting and placement and some of the content rules. Uh, so make sure you're signed up for our events newsletter to hear about that. Um, there's also a special edition influencer marketing insight newsletter that we're hoping to have ready in the next couple of weeks. So make sure you get yourself on that mailing list too. You can sign up on the website www.asa.org.uk. Uh, and also, if you have any feedback on this webinar or suggestions for content to cover in future webinars, do let us know at events at asa.org.uk. Thank you and goodbye.